Okay. Right, so again, good morning, everyone. I'm Prima. I'm going to be presenting um, a summary, in a sense, of the LHCB detector upgrade that has been going on through Long Shutdown 2, so for the past couple of years, and a little bit onto uh, the operations, which started uh, this year. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Federico, so a lot of these slides and content are his, uh, are his. So Federico is our commissioning coordinator, and somewhere in one of the many photos in here, I'll point him out. So he's somebody that if you ever go to the control room, you're very, very likely uh, to see. Okay, so uh, I start off with the original, the, the LHCB detector for run one and run two. I think you've already seen this before, so I'm going to go over the first few slides very, very quickly. But again, just as a reminder, this is a single arm spectrometer. It was initially designed for the study of beauty and charm quirks, uh, the case of beauty and charm quirks predominantly, which is why it's it's instrumented purely in the forward region, so along the beam pipe. Um, but that being said, uh, what we've done with this expands, just goes well past what was initially envisaged as the physics program for run one and run two. So there's been, of course, studies of beauty and charm hadrons, but we also have an exotics program, and we've had uh, quite a few uh, excellent results with our run one and run two data set. And in a lot of ways, our physics program is complementary to that of Atlas and CMS and also of Bell and Bell two. So the requirements for what the physics that we do um, is we need precision, primary and secondary vertex reconstruction and efficient tracking, excellent particle identification. This is very, very important for us. And also we need uh, an efficient trigger. And that's just because that helps us uh, select uh, our data very well. It helps us increase, I mean, it helps us use our resources efficiently and maximize the amount of signal, so data that we want to study that we keep uh, on disk and process for analyses. I'm just going to, I'm mentioning these points here because we'll probably come back to these three points a lot in the next few slides. All right, so again, this is a recap. Uh, just in broad strokes, the LHCB detector consists of tracking systems, which uh, in run one and run two were the vertex locator or the VELO. So this is precise reconstruction of the primary interaction points, the primary vertex, and secondary vertices for slightly long lived particles. So precise reconstruction of both so that we can separate between them. As you all probably know, maybe even be much better than me probably, this is really, really important for the study of decays of uh, B hadrons. So, and then we had the silicon tracker, which consisted of a four layer uh, strip tracker upstream of the magnet. Let me hope I used the pointer correctly. And three tracking stations downstream of the magnet, where the innermost region was again silicon strips, and the outer region, the outer tracker, um, were uh, the straw tubes. Okay. Uh, we also have calorimetry, so uh, an ECAL, uh, an electromagnetic calorimeter, and a hadronic uh, calorimeter. These were located starting at about 12 and a half meters away from the, the interaction point. So in run one and run two, we had also um, a pre-shower and a scintillating pad detector. Mm -hmm. And this system provided not just uh, calorimeter information, but was also used as part of a level zero or a hardware-based trigger. Um, to in order to have a first set of selection of events. And then uh, for the rest of particle identification, we have two ring imaging Cherenkov detectors. Again, you know this. We have two, one upstream of the magnet, one downstream of the magnet meant for looking at uh, or PID for particles of different momenta. And then we had a muon spectrometer, where again, we had five stations of multi-wire proportional ch chambers and uh, the first station of this M or M0 was meant to provide uh, also uh, provide information to this level zero. So this first stage of uh, triggering in run one and run two, which was hardware based, had information from the calorimeter and the muons. Okay, so you might say, well, you just said three slides ago, we did an excellent job in run one and run two, why upgrade? So from the physics perspective, um, we've had excellent results, but we still are in a lot of ways uh, limited by statistical uncertainty. So you can see here a set of, well, current LHCB is not quite true. This is current LHCB when this document a few, from a few years ago was published. But in a lot of cases, if you, if you look at your statistical uncertainty and your systematic uncertainty, the statistical uncertainty still dominates. So we can do a lot better with a lot more data. And 
we do not fully use the collisions that LHC gives us. So uh, the, the first, the detector, and we'll talk a bit about more about this later, um, the run one and run two detector was designed so that on average, uh, the number of collisions you have per interact, so per crossing of two proton bunches was around one. But the LHC has a lot more than one mean interaction per bunch crossing. If if you just look at its ability and what was current, it was providing even in run one and run two. So um, it was a good opportunity. It was it was a good thing, or it was really um, useful that we we try and take advantage of this. And um, also to note that we had to because of aging after about eight nine years of operation, a lot of our detectors would have had to have been replaced anyway. So it was a good chance to also upgrade them for better performance or for similar performance in much more difficult conditions. So this is why we had LHC upgrade one, which, like I said, um, the detectors, there was a lot of R&D done even well before uh, 2015 here, but these were sort of assembled and uh, installed during LS2, which ended the end of March uh, this year. And then since then, since the start of 2022, aha, uh -huh, this is this is a little bit of an old uh, Diagram, this was a pre COVID. So uh, shift all of this by a year. Um, but we've, we've, we, we had long shutdown too from uh, the end of, so the start of 2019 all the way to uh, the spring, spring of this year. And run three started basically uh, in April or May this year and will go on for, for three years. So what does this look like between what we had in run one and run two and now? So you notice that we have a five-fold increase in the number of interactions, mean interactions per bunch crossing. So that's great for us because that means uh, we can take five times more data in the same amount of time, integrated time. And um, so what we would expect is to collect by the end of runs three and four, about 50 inverse femto parts. And a thing to note for us that might be a bit different for, for Atlas and CMS, and again, you've probably seen this before, um, a lot of the data we collect is actually signal for us. So it's not so much that you're looking in, you know, for a needle in a haystack, you can throw away a lot of hay and just keep the needles. We're looking for a particular needle in a stack of needles. So we want to try and keep, we want to try and collect a lot of data and keep as much of it as possible because a lot of it is interesting for us for our physics program. So the challenges for this upgrade, five times the amount of data in the same amount of time is great. So five times the instantaneous luminosity is, is great. But what that means is your detectors have to handle five times the occupancy. So that's that's a lot more stuff going through your detectors, which makes your tracking more difficult. So you have to have more precise tracking, more your, your particle identification. All of your detectors have to have better like sort of granularity so that you take more precise pictures, if you will, of this. And also five times the amount of uh, High, high energy particles going through means that your detectors age quite fast. That's a lot of radiation damage. So you need to start, you, you need to have upgraded detectors that can withstand that so that they're operational for all of run three and run four by design. Okay, so again, we this was driven, so this, this upgrade was driven by, if you want to get five times the amount of data, the, the primary limiting factor for, uh, for run, for, for runs one and two was the level zero hardware trigger. So this meant that, you know, while the LHCB uh, bunch crossing rate is 40 megahertz, uh, once every 25 nanoseconds, our level zero hardware read out at one megahertz, so processed information at one megahertz. And in addition, we had to have a selection criteria. So the, here you needed uh, high transverse energy or transverse momentum. So you had to throw away a lot of uh, potentially interesting physics events by construction and so the biggest improvements the driving force behind our upgrade is the fact that we now get rid of a hardware trigger so we will have a software only trigger that we so we have to fully read out and trigger at 30 megahertz so this is the inelastic uh event rate so we have to basically be building events in our software high level trigger at this 30 megahertz rate okay so what does this what does this look like? And I'll remind you again. So the driving force is the fact that we have a software only trigger. For this, we have a new uh, Velo, which is now with pixel sensors instead of uh, silicon microstrips. We have new tracking stations. So there's the UT, which is a silicon microstrip detector in front of the magnet in place of what was a TT in run, runs one and two. 
And instead of the silicon IT and the straw OT uh, in the tracking stations downstream of the magnet, we have one tracking technology based on scintillating fibers. So that's the sci-fi tracker. Um, there's also quite a lot. So all the detectors upgraded that are electronic. So this goes for the rich, the calorimeters, and the muons. Um, with the rich, we have upgraded uh, photomultiplier tubes for readouts and electronics. And also, uh, again, for the calorimeter, we upgraded the front end electronics and we removed the SPD and the PS because these were uh, these were used for particle identification, but also for the level zero trigger. And again, for the muons, we removed the, the level zero muon trigger station and, as always, upgraded front end electronics. And here's why. Um, a lot of the detectors for run one and run two were not designed to read out um, at 30 megahertz because if you have, if you want to read out your full detector, that, that means all of your readout electronics have to handle that very high throughput rate and into your trigger and onwards. So for us, what this means is we've replaced, we've upgraded most of our detector channels, all of the readout electronics and all of the all of the downstream DAQ, the data acquisition uh, structure. So this is basically a very, very new detector. Okay, so uh, quickly going into a summary of what's been changed for the vertex locator. So for, for the VELO, uh, what you want is you want to retain, and again, this is going to be a common theme for all of your detectors. Your basic idea is that you want to retain, at least retain the same performance you had in runs one and run two in a much more challenging environment. So for the VELO, that means we have to keep high tr track and vertex resolution, given the fivefold increase in interactions per bunch crossing. And also, again, the VELO is very, very close uh, to your interaction point, so it has to handle extremely high radiation doses. So here you can see a little diagram of the the dose profile, and you it's 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 very it falls off very quickly, but is extremely high uh, near the interaction point. So your your sensors have to withstand this kind of radiation. So here, in order to get better resolution, the higher granularity, um, the, the VELO moved from silicon microstrips to hybrid pixels. You have uh, 52 modules. You can see this in the schematic here with two retractable halves. Um, the innermost sections are around 5.1 millimeters from the beam pipe. So this is a nice little image. In runs one and two, they were about eight millimeters for the beam pipe, from the beam pipe. And what you're looking at here is a five centime coin. So that's, that's smaller than your little Euro five centime coin. Um, and you have four sensors per module with about 50, there are 55 uh, microns by 55 microns. And the sensors are also thinner at about 200 micrometers as opposed to 250 micrometers, if I remember correctly, in, run, in runs one and two. Because uh, also with to, to keep your performance, what you try and do always is to minimize the amount of materials. That way you minimize the amount of uh, material interactions. Again, that's, that's a bit better for you to reconstruct your signal well. Okay. So uh, the VELO also, for, in order to cool their, uh, their silicon sensors, they, have, uh, they maintain the silicon temperature at minus 20 to minus 30 uh, using these uh, evaporated biphase uh, CO2 cooling in these micro channels uh, in a substrate underneath the sensors. So this is minimal material for your cooling within your detector acceptance. Um, and they also have a custom uh, VELO ASIC front-end readout chip that has to handle very, very high um, uh, data or hit rates. Um, and since the VELO operates is, is, is very, very close to the beam and uh, the interaction point, it operates in a secondary vacuum. So it's separated from the primary LHC beam vacuum by an RF foil. Um, and this new foil, again, uh, to, to sort of minimize the amount of material, uh, was thinned from about 350 micrometers to 250 micrometers. And it still needs to withstand pressures of up to uh, 10 millibar, you can see. Uh, moving on a little bit, the upstream tracker um, stays a similar concept. So it's still a silicon strip detector, but uh, finer uh, strips, thinner strips before, so finer granularity. And the innermost sensors, again, are closer to the beam pipe. So this, this helps you with your, uh, with your, with your uh, reconstruction, your event reconstruction. And um, the, the structure is, very, is similar to what we had for uh, a lot of the tracking detectors of run one and run two, where we have four layers. The, the, the outermost layers are, are vertical, and then your innermost layers are tilted by stereo angles of plus or minus five degrees. And so here we have four different types of sensors based on how close you are to the beam pipe. And these are mounted on lightweight staves. And again, um, because all of your readout needs to be adapted, the, the UT as well had a novel readout uh, salt basic chip. 
All right, so the scintillating fiber tracker. So for the sci-fi, what you need for, for this, um, the, the sort of the driving forces for the design were that you needed to have something that covered a large area. So in, in runs one and two, for the innermost area where you had higher occupancy, so you needed a little higher resolution, we used silicon strips and then a straw tracker on the outside, the OT, but that's twice the amount of services cooling. All the technology is different. So uh, for the upgrade, what it was tried, we tried to find the solution that was sort of a common solution that, that keeps your good momentum resolution through your acceptance, which is quite large area. And you have to be able to instrument quite a large area, like uh, two and a half meters by, by three meters. So here um, we use scintillating fibers. So these are uh, scintillating fibers that produce light in around the 420 uh, nanometer range. So that's uh, very dark blue. So this is uh, three times four layers. So each one of these three stations has four layers of scintillating fiber mats. So it's about 11,000 kilometers of fibers that are woven into mats. Each mat has six uh, layers of these fibers. Uh, I think there's a, I might have a better just thing on the next page. Um, and so, yes, and, and, and the idea here is that you need coverage of, of about two, three meters from the beam pipe and each module. So one of these long black strips is composed of uh, eight mats. And the readout for these fibers is provided by silicon photomultipliers. So yes, here you can actually see the six layers of your, of your mat. Um, and on one end, on the outer ends of these, you have silicon photomultiplier arrays to, to read out uh, the light produced in these fibers. And these need to be cooled to minus 40 degrees to minimize dark on rates, to minimize effects of irradiation. So here you want uh, your detection efficiency for, the, for a single photon to be about 45%. And these, again, uh, all of our readout electronics needed to be upgraded. So the CIPMs uh, also for, this, for the, for the sci-fi tracker, we use a custom uh, Pacific ASIC chip that allows you to, and then we also have a clustering board. So clustering on FPGAs uh, within the front end electronics uh, structure. Right. So for the rich, um, the rich detectors have new uh, flat mirrors uh, for better photon yield, and the focal plane were the focal plane and the optics were modified so you increase the size of the Cherenkov rings. That again improves uh, your ability to handle the higher occupancy. And for this, the photo detectors also needed to be upgraded. So we went to multi-anode photomultiplier tubes, which again gives you finer granularity than the previous uh, PMTs, photomultiplier tubes, and Again, uh, I think I'll stop repeating this, but read out electronics, everything needed to be handled, needed to, to be able to handle a rate of data taking of 40 megahertz. Okay, uh, for the calorimeters and the muon, so the calorimeters, the technology could be kept, uh, the same technology, so the same uh, calorimeter cells and modules could be kept for run three, so they did not need to be replaced right now because of radiation damage. But of course, all the front end electronics needed to be rebuilt. And also to handle the higher occupancy and degradation due to irradiation, uh, the PMT gain had to be reduced by a factor of five. And so to compensate for this, the front end gain was increased by the same factor. And there's um, a custom low noise front end ASIC developed to in improve your signal to noise ratio. And also the reconstruction was improved for a higher occupancy environment. And for the muon detector as well, we had uh, upgraded electronics and the first uh, gem layer for the L0 trigger was removed. Okay, we also have a smog 2 system. So this is a system that can inject various gases uh, around the interaction point. So this is uh, quite special to us. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very cool because it allows you to have a very nice fixed target program uh, at the LHC. And this happens in parallel with proton-proton uh, data taking. So this is a cell that is attached to the VELO, and then you can have a, a displaced proton gas interaction. So for example, it depends on, on what gases you inject. We can inject neon, helium, and a few others uh, with this smoke system. So this allows you to have a physics program that spans looking at the antiproton production, looking at uh, central production, uh, quite a few decays, and, and also um, it allows us to look at heavy ion runs where you look at the smoke program with the uh, LHC ion beams, either lead-lead or proton-lead uh, data taking. Okay, just a few highlights because uh, 
photographs are nice and because it's been a fun two years at the pit. So these are a few highlights from the assembly and installation that occurred uh, during long shutdown too. So here you see one half of the velo being inserted in and the same, the other half, I think, of the velo as well being worked on. And this was these pictures were taken, I think, in the spring of this year. Um, for the rich, you see installed these multi-anode PMTs for the photodetector readouts and uh, one set of uh, mirrors, so a full, uh, full mirror plane for uh, one of the rich detectors. Uh, for the UT, quite recently, this was a completed set of staves for the seaside detector, which was just lowered down uh, into the experimental cavern on Monday of this week. So this is our uh, main uh, equipment shaft at point eight. And for the scintillating fiber tracker, this is the fully installed sci-fi and fully closed. So this is the first layer that you see taken from the magnet looking towards uh, the calorimeter and the muons. Uh, you see the beam pipe here. And also um, just to, to show you what's outside this very pretty picture on the edges here are all of the cable chains that you see for, for services, for your readout cables, your power cables, uh, et cetera. Okay. Again, uh, I go back to what we said before. This was driven by by the fact that we now have um, we have a readout at 30 megahertz. So what we have now is real time data processing. So a software only trigger in the upgrade. And so since we must fully process events at 30 megahertz, and the reason this is also useful because it allows you to make better decisions on what data to keep. Right? If you can have full event reconstruction for every one of those events that all of your detector information that comes in at this 30 megahertz rate that allows you to make better decisions in your trigger of what events to keep for for your various physics analyses so this you need this information from old sub detectors at the first software trigger level stage so we store events in a buffer for online alignment and calibration as well and we should be able to trigger on signatures also that are sort of non-standard, large impact parameter, uh, high transverse momentum, and that again allows you to expand the kind of physics you can study uh, with the detector. And you really, because we're reading out a lot of data, you want to make sure you're reducing, trying to reduce your event size uh, to write to disk to about uh, two to five uh, gigabits per second. And the reason is because uh, computing is not a given resource for us, right? So uh, as as this is a very nice little uh, meme that I like, which is, you know, fit physics physicists ideas into standard computing resources. So this is an order of magnitude increase in the amount of data we would store as a unit of time compared to what we had before, but it's not as if we can also have an order of magnitude increase in the corresponding offline computing resources. Um, so we moved towards a model that was already used in run two, which is uh, what we called turbo, which saves only sort of reconstructed outputs to raw uh, data. So we, we eliminate or we try, this is the goal sort of to work as, as we get through run three to start eliminating, saving a lot of raw data to disk. As much as we can, we try to process things upstream, so as close to your detector as possible, within the trigger, and we save only this sort of processed uh, data to disk for offline analysis. Okay, so triggerless readout. Um, again, what this means is we're removing, again, what it means when we remove the first level har hardware trigger is that we have to accept all of the LHC bunch crossing like information at the front end. So your front ends also have to be able to process and read out this information at 30 megahertz, which is a huge increase from what we had uh, in runs one and two. And the back end electronics also have to be able to cope with these high rates. So you can see here, uh, we have a completely new data center. So these uh, six little cabins, uh, which which house our uh, back end electronics. So this is what we call tell, you might hear the word tell 40s. So these readout cards, these back end electronics cards are all housed here, along with uh, our the, the cards that also send out trigger information and timing information. So we have, these are all part of these common back end boards called PCIe 40s. And again, uh, that's quite a lot because that means you basically have to have a lot of uh, optical fibers from your cavern 100 meters underground to this data center on the surface. You're, you're bringing up a lot of data. So this is, I think, about our, our cables and overall from the detector out are close to 200, I think, over 200 meters uh, in length. So you have to transmit data well to, across like 200 plus meters of optical fibers, and there's hundreds of thousands of uh, readout channels. Anyway. And that's a lot of bandwidth. So this is, we, we really measure in terabits per second. Okay, uh, another new feature that's sort of, I think, uh, 
pioneered by LHCB as a, as, as a consequence of this 30 megahertz readout is the fact that we have uh, in our first level software trigger HLT1, we now have uh, GPUs to process data. And so this HLT1 program is called, is called Allen. So we can have a, we can, we, we can have our fully our first level software trigger uh, with GPUs. So this is has been implemented, can be running standalone. Um, there's a lot of work being done in the last year uh, through the first period of commissioning with Beam on this, and it's 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 continuously improving. Um, it gives us a lot of flexibility. So here you have uh, your GPUs in the back end. So this is your PCI 40 card, which I mentioned before, is the back end readout board that you have. And these are housed in a server that have these GPUs, which then process uh, process your data further. So we can run our first level trigger at 30 megahertz, so at the visible uh, event rate. Okay, just as a note, um, this will be more into the operations that I'll talk about very shortly, but it's uh, if you ever take shifts, this is something that is also you will you will get to see the product of our online monitoring system. So this is a really complex system where we take part where we can in real time as we're taking data also send a subset of these events to a monitoring system. And what that allows us to do is get very, very quick feedback, near instantaneous feedback on how our detectors are doing, at least at a very basic level. Because of course, if you have issues with if your data quality isn't good, you want to try and spot it as soon as possible. So this provides output to the LHCB control room, in particular the shift the control room shifter that we call a data manager, um, also to experts, also to run controls. So this is quite flexible. It allows us to do a lot of stuff and it's it's fundamental to automatizing the readout system and control. And it's also fundamental to having quick a quick first level feedback on data quality, which allows you to fix, to catch and fix any issues you might have with your detectors or with your data acquisition as fast as possible. Okay. Uh, I move a little bit into data taking with the upgrade uh, LHCB detector. So before I start, has anyone here taken, I, I know a couple might be, but has everyone here seen the control room or yet? No, yes. Okay, a few people have seen it or, or is it, how, who hasn't seen the control room or who has not taken shifts yet? I assume a lot of you. All right, great. This is going to be my pitch for you to join us in the control room in the next couple of years. Okay, so, um, it's it's very very important uh, that we take well. It's very important if we've mentioned a lot that we want to take five times the amount of data as quick uh, that we did in run one and run two. But what that means is we also want to take that data efficiently, right? We we have a limited amount of time with LHC giving us collisions, and you don't want to lose any of it if you don't need to. So we really rely on um, our. We rely on a shift program to make sure that we are taking data efficiently um, through this. And this is something where we have uh, central shifter roles, two uh, at all times in the control room that I'll talk about a little bit, that basically uh, everybody in the collaboration can contribute to. So this is extremely, extremely important for us to take data efficiently. So we have um, two central shifters and also supported by a very large group of on-call uh, detector shifters plus experts plus central shifters plus central experts. So at LHCB, we rely uh, on volunteering. So this, again, might be different if you worked on other collaborations before. There's no formal quota there for any institutes or any person. Um, it's just uh, it's just we we would we we invite everybody to come join us for at least a few shifts in the control room. And just to give you an idea here, so we have two shifts two central shifters, the shift leader and the data manager. And in run, run one and two, um, the sort of mean, the, the median was about 3.5. So you just had to take sort of three shifts per year. Um, and that already, that's a huge contribution. And it, it, allows, um, it allows for a lot of efficiency in data taking if everybody contributes a little bit. So even taking one or two shifts when you can is extremely, extremely useful to the collaboration and to operate the operation of the LHCB detector. So this uh, worked. This approach worked very well in run one and run two. So we're going to have th we have the the same approach in run three, and I'll give you a few details in a bit. Um, so we had about 450 uh, different uh, people either taking a central control room shifts or taking on call uh, shifts. So that's that's quite a high fraction of the collaboration that gets to contribute to operations. So it's it's also a really good way to get closer to the detector and uh, data taking. 
Okay, so this is a picture of the control room. I hope you all get to visit soon. Uh, this is where we have our two shifters. We have the main control panel that I'll talk about where we operate the detector and uh, where the data manager sits. So this is the first, the first uh, level data quality check. So we have the shift leader, which is the shift lead with the full version is the SLIMOS, so the shift leader in matters of safety, and they handle potentially looking at any issues with our data acquisition, so our run control and our detector state. And what they're supposed to do is also liaise with experts, with the sub-detector on call, so specialists in various detectors. They have to uh, give people access to the cavern if needed, again, with help or with the support of uh, LHCB central technical coordination. You're also supposed to handle any requests or, or um, accesses by the fire brigade, etc. So this is the shift leader is sort of the, the first port of call for all matters of safety and operation in the control room. And the data manager is there because, again, we want very quick feedback on our data. So this is extremely useful. And also we require uh, at least two people in the control room for, for safety reasons at all times. So these are 24 seven shifts. Uh, we have a lot of very nice fancy screens. You can see uh, a lot of monitoring because again, uh, Efficient data taking relies on finding problems as quickly as possible. So you can see there's a huge number of screens here looking at your running conditions, whether your event builder, so your, your uh, trigger and other and further data downstream data processing are running. Um, we have a phone call uh, to the uh, to the between the LHCB and LHC one phone that we're supposed to leave free for them. This is really fun. Probably the only physical button panel that we have in the control room. It is the, the main detector safety panel. So that's a general emergency stop. Uh, don't I wouldn't press it if if it's not really a general emergency. That did, I think, happen once this year. Uh, it, it's the first time I've ever seen it. So, so, um, but it's meant, it's really meant to be for the safety of, of your detector. So this is your main detector safety system. It allows you to cut power very quickly in case an emergency is needed, but we also have software versions of the safety systems uh, as well. Okay, so again, the two, uh, we have two control room shifters. So the shift leader is responsible for safety, supervision of any activities in and around the control room and the, the cavern, or the, that's the first line of uh, supervision that we have. Uh, the supervision of the detector control system. So this is the system that basically checks that your detector is in a good state, keeps it in a good state and takes data. And also is the first line of contact for experts and PKs or so on calls from the sub detectors or the central uh, central expert team and also for uh, coordination with uh, the LHC again to first order. So this is a shift leader. The, this is a shift uh, type that has to be present in the control room at all times because at some points you might need to handle accesses down to the cavern. Uh, you might need to answer and in push real buttons. So the detector safety panel. So this is this has to be an in-person shift. Um, and so this is a role with a little bit more responsibility, but I will say that I, I don't I say that in that maybe you just need a little bit of experience before maybe trying to transition here. Once you have some experience with operations either through a sub detector or central shifts or detector commissioning or operations, you could go to shift leader because you could still take shift leaderships. You don't have to be a senior postdoc or a permanent. This is not the case at all because. We are, it's, it's a little bit more responsibility, but you don't require a lot of technical knowledge. And we are always supported by an extremely helpful and extremely nice team of like central experts and detector experts. So you're never left alone with uh, emergency situations. And then the second uh, central shifter that we have 24 seven in the control room is data manager. So for primarily for the, as a first level of data quality monitoring and also um, as a matter of safety, because we do want to have two people in the control room uh, at all times. So this is a really good way to get started with taking shifts when you're new to the collaboration or new to shift taking or operations, because there's no direct responsibility. You always can feed things off of the shift leader. And again, for data quality, you can also get feedback from detector experts. So you don't have any direct responsibility for safety. So this is really an excellent, uh, an excellent opportunity for new students, particularly to get new students, new postdocs to get involved uh, in operations. So we have periodically um, a one and a half day training and, and then we recommend if you can, that you do a shadow shift. So you come into the control room and sit next to the shift leader or data manager, uh, maybe a day or two before your shift. And the training can be remote. So I think we will probably have a training early next year, maybe about a month before shifts actually start. 
Um, and there's like extensive documentation and we keep trying to improve this with uh, instructions. And so it, I think the link here is missing, but I, I will link to the last shift training if you want to get a look of what the kind of documentation and the responsibilities are. So the shift leader and data manager are both generally non-expert LHV members. So we rec or we recommend and we we invite everybody to come and uh, contribute to operations with these uh, central control room shifts. The shift leaders are required to know slightly more about LHCV, but this is something that you can do by initially taking data manager shifts or by if your institute works on a particular sub detector by taking on call shifts for the detector so you get a feel for operations uh, in, in and around the control room. Um, so these are also self assigned. Uh, the schedule is validated by the run coordinators of Federico. And again, as we say, it's, it's not that you have to take a ton of shifts per year, just taking one or two, just a few, um, really, really helps the collaboration uh, a lot. Okay. So as I said, those two control room shifters are supported by a group of on-call uh, shifters and experts. So uh, the primary source of contact for any central or uh, Central coordination issues is the run sheet. So this is also this is a weekly or bi uh, biweekly on call shift uh, that a uh, shift shifter that assists the run coordinator in the daily operation of LHCB. So handles the first level coordination um, or any sort of issues that might require decisions between the LHC, LHCB or within LHCB of what we need to do for operations or what kind of run program we want to run for the day. Um, they also have to uh, go into they, they, the run chief also sort of uh, chairs the run meetings that we have a few times per week, a couple of times per week, up to daily. Um, going to the LHC morning meeting, so this is also where we, we get news on the LHC's plan for operations for the next day or two, and we can um, discuss and provide feedback or make requests if we need. So that is handled by the run chief, so a more senior person in the collaboration and quite a bit more, well, senior in, in terms of experience. So this is something that you would do maybe after you have a few years of experience, either um, as a detector expert or with central shifts or usually both. Um, and then this can this is usually one or two people, but this is, uh, this is really your primary source of support for central coordination issues when you are a shift leader, for example. Um, and then we also have substance and decay. So if you have an issue that you see with a particular sub detector, each detect each sub detector has 24/7 uh, availability uh, via an on call uh, an on call PK. So this is what we call on call shifters, and they are supported by on call experts, so backup experts that have expertise in a particular part of the sub detector. So again, these are usually weekly shifts. So if you are on an institution that, for example, works on the Velo or the Sci-Fi. Or the UT, this is some. This is another way you can contribute to operations and get a bit, maybe a bit more expertise on one sub detector. Um, and again, here these are week long shifts, twenty four seven on call, and also need to usually. So this is left to the coordination of the sub detectors. But in general, um, this is something that you also have to be around uh, point eight to do. Because in case you need to do a hardware intervention, you sort of in a hurry. You want to be able to get to the the detector. Uh, as as quickly as possible, but this is not a mandatory rule. This can vary from sub detector to sub detector. Okay, if traveling to CERN often is not something you can do, we also have uh, shifts that can be taken remotely. So these are the data quality computing and simulation shifts or DQCS. So this is a new role in Run3 that combines a few things, that, a few different types of shifts, uh, remote shifts that we had in Run2. So the idea of combining them was so that we improve communication uh, with central shifters. And then it also gives you, because all of these are reasonably light by themselves, so it gives you uh, a bit more heft to your, to your shifts. And, and you get to acquire quite a bit of knowledge on a lot of the data processing stream, uh, all of the computing, and also on, on simulation. So these three tasks have uh, different experts. So we have a single set of training, but based in with different pieces based on experts from the different systems. So we have data quality monitoring tools, um, and this is where you would do something sort of similar to what the data manager does, but on a run-by-run -run basis, because then you are the first line to flag whether or not the data taken over the past 30 minutes or one hour for uh, while you're da taking data is good. And that's sort of something that then is propagated downstream to analysts. Um, you also monitor production issues in the computing domain. So this is looking at our grid 
uh, tools for, for offline data processing, making sure there aren't any problems there. If there are reporting to shifters or the, the coordinators for the offline uh, computing, and then also to look at the simulation quality of Monte Carlo. So these, this is something that is new for run three, and that's because we do have a lot of requests for simulation by analysts. And it's good to, to sort of be efficient with our resources to try and also do monitoring of this. So create a small validation sample, monitor it. So we provide tools and training so that what you do is do a first check of any large requests that might come through for simulation. And that allows you to spot any problems early on so that we don't end up with large productions that then are, are faulty. So it, it's really quite important because we rely a lot on all of this in order to, to be able to do analyses. And it's also quite nice because this is something that can be potentially, this can be done, these can be remote shifts, you don't need to be here. Um, and so, and, and which of these three is most pressing during your shift will of course vary throughout the year. Uh, data quality is something that you will mostly have during data taking periods. So usually between April and uh, the end of November each year. Um, computing and simulation all year long, but there will be peaks and troughs as you might expect. So here, these are day shifts as well. So these are not 24 seven on call or, or anything. So, and these uh, can be remote and again, done on a self-assignment basis. So this is a, also a really nice way to contribute to something that's essential for us to take data um, without needing to travel to CERN. Okay, so let me take a look at the time. Let's see, okay. Uh, I think I will try and be quite quick through the next slides. I'll, the slides are up, so you can always look at it later. Um, but just as a note, in the control room, um, we have a hierarchical control system that essentially allows us through sort of a tree like this to basically reach any device in the experiment. And like I said, this is, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of channels of front end electronics, the back end electronics, power, uh, power supply channels, both for your electronics, for, for biasing uh, any silicon sensors or, uh, or so this is quite a high, um, this is quite a complex system, but, but having this hierarchical control system allows you to have a very high level of automation with your um, detector basically controlled through two uh, panels. So this is what the shift leader sees and stares at for most of their shift. So this is highly automatized. So you have a high voltage, low voltage panel um, called Big Brother. So this is the one you see here. And what this does is it checks the LHC state. Um, correspondingly chooses a state for LHCB high and low voltages to keep the detector safe, um, and then selects a corresponding activity. And based on this, the run control, which is what actually takes your data, um, will follow this, fo based on this activity, will follow a procedure to start taking data of, a, for, of a various types. So for example, if I were in physics, I would be taking collision data on this uh, terrible screenshot. What you see here is cosmic, and the reason uh, the reason the screenshots are, are terrible granularities, as it turns out, I don't have very many screenshots when everything is green because I tend to take more screenshots when there are problems. So I struggle a little bit to find a, find, find a very happy uh, green screenshot with everything, with all of our sub detectors included. But this is run control. This is your data acquisition system. So you can see here, we, this is a, from, I think, September when the LHC had no beam. We were running Cosmics data. Um, with all of our sub detector partitions included. You can see we have an input and output rate that is non zero. That's great. That means we're writing things to disk. Um, but what this run control does is it, from the activity, we have a little autopilot that automatically then loads a set of recipes. So configurations to your front end electronics, to your trigger. Um, it configures all of these. And once everything looks okay, it starts taking data. So something that the shift leader might do is if this is not okay, eventually this thing, um, it tries to recover, but it's it's not an extremely intelligent system. It tries a few standard things for recovery. And if it fails, um, it goes into red, it says help. And you hear a very nice little automated voice in the control room that says, autopilot needs help, please take a look. So um, it's something that and that allows a lot of automation, but that's not to say that the shift leader has nothing to do because it doesn't always just work smoothly for eight hours. There will be times where you need to respond, try and take actions in usually also in, in consultation with somebody from a sub detector or whatever part of your run control uh, is causing problems. Okay, again, I'm going to be very quick here just as a note that the, there's a lot of complexity here in talk in in communication and in, in the information that needs to be exchanged between the LH, between LHCB and the LHC. So there's a lot of interconnectivity between the accelerator and all of the experiments because this is 
so that we can have protection for our system and for and for their uh, machine through fast beam extraction, so beam dumps. An example being uh, the Velo, since it, it moves very, very close to the interaction point, is retracted when, when you don't have stable beams. And if, for example, there were a problem, you would require, or there's a system, an interlock system, that uh, would, would dump the beam because it's not safe for the Velo to be closed if you are not in, in stable beams. And we have a few, a lot of conditions like this. So we have a very complex interlock system. Um, so for the safety, so for protection of, of the machine and for the detectors through this fast beam extraction of, for dumping, also for sort of automating procedures, uh, for automating operational procedures, you can see a lot of exchange here. And, and this is a lot of parameters. So this is, if you, this is LHCB and the LHC, there's many, many parameters that are sort of being sent back and forth uh, between the detectors uh, and the accelerator here. So it's, it's, it's quite a complex system and it's impressive like how that it works quite well because it, it does really look like this a lot of times. Okay, um, I will maybe very, very quickly, uh, I think I might actually skip through so we have a bit of time for questions, but uh, these are, I will just, Again, you can feel free to look through the slides. Um, just something to note for luminosity. So this is just a measure of how many collisions we get per second per centimeter square. Um, we have a lower, so we're mid -lumi com luminosity compared to Atlas or CMS, so they have much higher numbers. But we level our luminosity, so you can see this is flat, whereas uh, for Atlas and CMS, of course, they decay as, as you go through a fill, as your beam quality uh, changes. Okay. Other words that you might hear, uh, mu, pile up, and mu, a lot. Uh, so just the what, what mu is is, a, is is sort of the average number of visible proton-proton interactions per bunch crossing, because this is something that, that we can measure. And this is when I said we take a factor five, uh, we, we have a factor five increase in data. What we're actually doing is we're increasing the average number of visible proton-proton uh, interactions per bunch crossing by a factor five. And as I said before, what we do is we level in luminosity, which I'll show you in the next slide, um, by sort of separating the beam so that we don't have purely head-on collisions. So we separate in the vertical plane the beam so they're sort of they have an offset when they collide, and this allows you to adjust the actual the average number of uh, visible uh, interactions that we have at point eight. And um, what we do is we change these parameters so that we get five times the amount of the amount of data. But that is what mu is. Um, pile up is the average number of proton proton interactions per visible event in, in visible events. So what this really is mathematically is you look at the Poissonian distribution of these events and you take your uh, zero suppressed mean. So for example, we have for a mu of 1.1, which is what we had on average for runs one and two, you would have a pile up of uh, 1.65. And mu is the average number of proton-proton interactions per bunch crossing, which is useful when you're trying to compare to simulation. Okay, as I mentioned, um, we have an automated leveling procedure, which again is quite nice. The way the LHC levels at our interaction point, again, is they choose, they have a vertical separation. Uh, so they have, <clears throat> so this can be um, adjusted at, at most, okay, so we, we can adjust it so that we decrease the amount of mean interactions for bunch crossing. And of course, uh, the most is the most that you can have is when we say when, when we're in a head-on state. So here, there's no more uh, vertical separation possible. And we have a real-time application that provides direct feedback to the LHC on what we are measuring as our uh, as our instantaneous luminosity. So as what we measure is mu, and they adjust their beam parameters, their separation parameter based on this until um, they reach or until we measure that we have reached the target that we've requested. So this is again one of the examples of the high interconnectivity. This is sort of a real-time application in the LHCB control room. And again, if it's something that you if it if you take shifts next to you, that's something that at the start of every fill, that's a panel that you will look at quite closely. Um, because this is something that again requires a lot of communication between the LHC and the LHCB control room if things aren't aren't going right. Okay, uh, just as a nice little picture of the control room with probably the most people I've seen uh, ever. Uh, this is the first stable beams on the 5th of July uh, of this year. So that's, it was, it's a really, 
it's also an ex extremely cool environment to be in now and something that's a little unusual because we have a new detector that we're commissioning. So it's it's very, very active compared to when you've been in stable operations for many years and you can rely on just two shifters. Now, um, during the day, you will have experts going in and out all the time, a lot of commissioning tests. So it's it's really a, a good time to be, uh, to be in the control room because I think you learn a lot about the experiment this way. So uh, we've done quite well. Uh, from 2010 to 2018, so for the first two runs, but uh, we'd like to collect more data, expand our physics program, and uh, for this we need uh, we needed to a huge upgrade to our detectors, the full readout system, and most of the detector channels. And our first year of commissioning with the LHC beam is complete, but we are by no means done. There's still a lot of work ahead of us to get to the point where we take data with all of our sub detectors in uh, very efficiently. So we're looking forward to seeing you ho hopefully in the control room in the next uh, in the next months and years. Much. Um, Any questions either in the room or, or on Zoom? Just stick your hand up or shout out. <laughs> yes. Hi, thanks. Yeah. Um, you say there's like a difference between 40 megahertz. Basically, why is why do community 30 megahertz when there's beams crossing at 40 uh, because megahertz? 30 megahertz is, sorry, that's the uh, go back many slides. So that's our like sort of inelastic. That's that's your sort of inelastic event rate. So that's your rate, uh, your full rate event building. But that that's sort of our equivalent. That's that's what we have if we're reading out every bunch crossing. So we are. It's just it's not quite the same as having uh, the 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 forty megahertz like uh, once every twenty five nanoseconds. But it's yeah. It's a, I let me see if I can explain the detail. I I don't know that I I can explain the technicalities actually. Okay, I'm that's just, all right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Questions? Yes. Okay. Hi. Thank you for this nice overview. Um, I had a question on Turbo. Um, I don't really understand. I have a hard time understanding what is meant by raw data versus HLT. I understand HLT uh, level reconstructed information. Um, but what is the road? What is left in the road data after the that is kept on either on tape or not saved on disk? So an example would be, say, for for a silicon tracker storing your raw hit information. Um, and in the turbo models, you didn't really store like hits. You would store tracks. You would store a particle like any PID. But but you don't store um, basically your building blocks for a lot of this. And while in, and, and of course, that's 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 risky because it means that if you are have not done your event reconstruction right, then then you don't have good data. But it's kind of something that we we have to move to if we want to read out uh, at the event. So all the more raw data is always kept on tape, anyways, at some point, and so then reprocessed. In, in, yeah. in run one and run two, in run one and run two, yes, we did have like raw data uh, on disk and then eventually on tape. But the idea for run three, so we're not there yet, of course, because we're commissioning, we're trying to understand how our detector is performing. But once we have a good idea of this and we are fairly confident, so we've, we've gotten to the point where we have efficient reconstruction in some trigger lines uh, and as many as possible, you would try and move to this model where you don't you don't save your hits. You just save your the, the signature that you're triggering on, but but more process. So the tracks in and, and, and basically your basically your, your decay, everything that is your signal decay and but not how you uh, all of the raw information used to build it. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, anyone else in the room? Seems we seem to be not seeing any hands in the room. Uh, anybody on Zoom? No, we're not seeing any questions on Zoom. It's all clearly very well explained. So thank you. Thank you again. Okay. Excellent. Break time. <laughs> yep, back at 11. Yeah, okay, so this is the 
speaker of the, the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> sorry um the introduction of the day and then we have a half an hour break so we'll rec reconvene at 11 and we're gonna have the big run three bonanza <laughs> um 